We're looking today at the night of Jesus' trials, and the writer of the Gospel of Mark doesn't mention all of them here, but um, in this one night, uh, Jesus would be put through six different illegal trials. There were three trials before the religious officials, and there were three trials before the Roman officials. And the reason these trials happened in such a rush all in one night was because the religious leaders were not allowed to execute criminals. Uh, the only the, Roman, the Romans had the authority to carry out capital punishment. And so in order to have this scheme work, uh, the religious leaders needed to charge Jesus uh, with blasphemy. And they were trying to work their way backwards from that, really. Blasphemy means to, honor, to dishonor God in a defiantly irreverent way. Uh, this, is, uh, this was a very serious crime in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 24, a man was stoned to death because he blasphemed the name of the Lord. And so this is what the religious leaders were trying to get Jesus to confess. And if they could find him guilty, they would condemn him to death. And that then would require the Romans to do their dirty work. But the Romans did, at this time, didn't care anything about any kind of blasphemy. Uh, the Romans were very polytheistic. They believed in many gods. And so what, what they would not tolerate were, were uprisings, revolts, rebellions. Well, so when the religious leaders brought Jesus to the Romans, it was with the charge of treason. They kind of translated translated it in a way that would offend them and cause them to stir up this offense uh, for, uh, for capital punishment. And the story of how we got to that point is here. Mark chapter 14, and uh, we're going to pick it up now as we've been going verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. We're going to pick it up here in verses 53 through 61. What's it? Mark chapter 14. Uh, let's start in verse 55. Now, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking the testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. And yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Now, keep in mind that Jesus was arrested on Thursday evening. Uh, they could not execute criminals during the Sabbath. The Sabbath for them was on Saturday so the deadline for these religious leaders was 6 p.m. Friday evening. And so that means that they had less than 24 hours to get Jesus, Jesus tried and crucified. But they were breaking all kinds of other rules in their legal proceedings. Uh, their own Jewish law stated that court proceedings uh, like this had to take place during the day. And here they were uh, at night in this kangaroo court trying to make it all happen. And what set all of these final events into motion was the betrayal of one of Jesus' own men. Judas was from Jesus' inner circle. Judas went to the religious leaders and he offered Jesus up. And so this was a huge break for them because the religious leaders had, had originally planned to arrest Jesus after the religious festival, after the the Passover. Uh, so they, they wanted to wait until all the people had dispersed. They'd gone back to their villages and towns. But when Jesus, when Judas came and offered Jesus up right then and there, they jumped all over it. And, and, and this put everything to fast forward motion. And that's why the religious leaders seemed to be only halfway ready. That they, they had witnesses, but the witnesses were not really, uh, didn't have their story straight. Uh, the religious leaders hated Jesus so much they would do anything to take him out. And this is really something that's been building for some time. Uh, from the start, they opposed Jesus. Uh, they were jealous of his growing popularity. Uh, but the last straw came when uh, it came after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. 
The resurrection of Lazarus was a powerful witness to everyone who heard about it. Here was a man from the nearby town of Bethany. He was beloved. His sisters mourned him. He was in the grave. He was dead and gone for four days. And then, there, and then Jesus came and brought him back to life. And now here he was walking around this Lazarus. He was walking around alive and well. And news spread about this great miracle that Jesus had done. And many people became followers of Jesus after this. But some people went and told the religious leaders about this mighty miracle. And what, what did they do in response to all of this? Did they launch an investigation to see if Jesus really was the Messiah? Did they check to see if these were authentic signs from God? No, at every turn they opposed him. And the more miracles he did, the more they despised him. John eleven forty seven says that the leading priests and the Pharisees called the high council together after this miracle. They asked, what are we going to do? And this man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. And then the Roman army will come and destroy our temple, our nation. They're being protected. And Caiaphas, who was high priest at the time, said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. And then verse 53 there in John 11, they summarizes their conclusion with these words. It says, so from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. This is the depravity of man on display. Son of God was walking around in their midst and all they can think about is how to capture him and kill him. Here was the devil using men to do his bidding. But this was all necessary for God's plan to unfold according to his will. Because this miscarriage of justice in the courts of men would provide our freedom in the courts of heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So Jesus didn't just die. His life wasn't just taken. No, he gave it up. And his, he died a criminal's death. He was perfect. And he died in our place to atone for our sins. And Jesus paid our penalty. Colossians 2.13 says, uh, listen to this, you were dead, you were dead because of your sins. And because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away. How? By nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. There's a story about a missionary and his family who were living in a remote village. And one day an enormous and dangerous snake slithered right through their front door and into the house. The whole family was terrified. They ran outside. They searched frantically for a local who might know what to do. A neighbor quickly came and, and to the rescue with a long machete. He walked calmly into the house and he struck the snake in the head, killing it. The neighbor reemerged triumphant. He assured the missionaries that the reptile was defeated. But he warned them that it was going to take a while for the snake to realize it was dead. He told them it takes, it takes time for a snake to stop moving. Even if you cut the head from the body, the snake doesn't realize that it's dead yet. And the head can still 
attempt to bite anyone who gets close to it. And so as the family waited outside, they could hear the snake still smashing into the furniture, causing all kinds of chaos. The body was flailing against the walls, causing damage, until almost an hour later, it was finally finished. And then the family was able to go back into their house safely. This is a picture of what happened at the resurrection. When Jesus arose from the grave, the old serpent was defeated. The devil's head was crushed. But Satan is spending his last hour, so to speak, thrashing around. He's doing all kinds of damage inside of this world. And so we, as God's children, we have three main enemies that we have to fight against, including this devil and his demons. But in addition to that, there's also this fallen world that we live in. The world has a culture that is opposed to God's standards. And in addition to all that, the world, the devil, we also have to deal with our own fallen flesh. The flesh are the things that our bodies desire but are taken too far. Uh, Romans 7, the Apostle Paul is describing this war waging inside of his body. Uh, he said, uh, Romans 7, I'll read it. He said, I, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death, thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. In the uh, English Standard Version of the Bible, Paul says, my members are waging war against my mind waging war there, that phrase is, is a Greek word that means to line up troops to go out on a military campaign. That's a picture of what sin wants to do inside of us. It's constantly opposing us. It wants to defeat and destroy us. The, the desires of our own flesh want to pull us down. That's, that's the reason why we have these weaknesses that we struggle with. That's why we have self-doubt. That's why Sometimes we tell each other, uh, we tell ourselves, I should say, that uh, we're not good enough. Uh, that's the reason we struggle with our purpose. And, and we struggle with finding uh, our own identity in Christ. We lose our way sometimes. And we stumble in the wrong direction. And so in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul, perhaps the greatest Christian, arguably, who ever lived, was feeling the weight of his wretchedness. The sin, the struggle, the battle was weighing heavy on his heart. But notice how he words it there in verse 24. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? He doesn't ask what will deliver me from this body of death. He doesn't ask when. He doesn't ask where, why, or how. No, no, he, he says, who? And then right away, the next verse 25 is the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In John chapter 1, Jesus went to John the Baptist in order to be uh, baptized, and uh, it says that when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And notice that it, he didn't say sins, plural, he said sin, singular, all the sin. Like if you can picture a, a giant garbage dump where all the sin of the world is piled up on top of each other, all the filth. All the depravity, all the stench, as high as you can see it. And it was that great 
big mountain that represents the sin of humanity. That is why Christ died. The price had to be paid. Jesus, one sacrifice, gives us the victory over that sin, over this flesh, over the world and its system, and over every devil and demon. 1 John 4.4 4 says, you, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Jesus changes everything for us. Uh, the trial that you're facing today might seem overwhelming. But you're not just going to survive. You're going to get through it. You're going to learn some lessons from it. You're going to get some experience under your belt, and you're going to come out better on the other side with wisdom. You might have some struggles with this flesh and its impulses, but the power of God will help you get stronger. Keep seeking him with all your heart, and he promises that you will find him. You may have some enemies conspiring against you like Jesus did that night. God will have the final say. And look now at how these enemies, these religious leaders, were finally able to find Jesus guilty in this illegal trial. Look at uh, the second part of verse 61, down to verse 65. It says, and again of Mark chapter 14, verse 61, second part of it says, Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do you need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving, deserving death. And some began to spit on him. And to cover his face. And to strike him saying prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. When Jesus said, when he answered the high priest with, I am, that was very significant to Jesus, and it was very significant to them. That answer goes back centuries to the time when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. God told Moses to go back to Egypt, and Moses' assignment was to lead the nation of Israel out of slavery. And in Exodus 3.13, it says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am means that God himself is guaranteeing what he's saying. God himself is going to take care of this problem. I am means that God is standing on his own word. He doesn't need anyone else to back him up. His will shall unfold according to his divine plan. It will be done because he is the great I am. And Jesus said something similar in Revelation 1.8. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega beginning and the end, says the Lord God, I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And 
So when Jesus said this to the religious leaders, I am, they understood exactly what he was talking about. They understood that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God, their Savior, their Messiah. And keep in mind here that, that Jesus had already performed so many miracles to authenticate who he was. Lepers had gone, from the, had gone to the temple over time uh, to confirm that they were clean. The blind could see, the deaf could hear. Entire villages had all of their sick healed. At Jesus' public baptism, people heard God the Father say that this was his son in whom he was well pleased. They saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. They heard John the Baptist testify that Jesus was the Messiah. And so there were, there were enough witnesses testifying that Jesus was the Savior. Even when Jesus encountered demon-possessed people, the demons inside, they recognized who Jesus was. The demons. Jesus claimed that he was the Son of Man was only blasphemous if it wasn't true. But if it was true, then Jesus was who he said he was. And it's at this point that Jesus' confession blew the room up. The religious leaders were outraged to the point where they attacked Jesus physically. They're right there on the spot, they spit on him, they slapped him. All of their pomp and circumstance was gone. Their formalities and their pleasantries disappeared. They broke through the wall of piety. And the evil inside of their hearts bubbled to the surface like a volcano. And through it all, Jesus remained quiet. He didn't defend himself. He didn't ask for his lawyer. He didn't ask to make a phone call. No, he remained quiet. And this silence fulfilled prophecy of the prophecy from Isaiah 53, 7, which says, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says that they even plucked his beard out. Luke 22, 64 says that they blindfolded him and said, prophesy to us, who hit you that time? And they hurled all sorts of terrible insults at him. And again, this is the depravity of man in full display. The Son of God was in their midst, and they're killing him. But when Peter tried to protect Jesus when they came to arrest him in the garden, uh, Jesus told him in Matthew 26, 53, Don't you realize that I can ask my Father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? This was God's plan all along. Our sin was so bad that God had to sacrifice his own son. That's how much he loves us. And there are times when we go through things that we don't understand. We don't get why this suffering is necessary. But all the while, there are greater things that are being worked out. In the backdrop, there are things happening in the moment that we don't understand. There's a great example of this in the Old Testament book of Job. Job, uh, Job had it all. He was healthy. He was wealthy. He had a large family, lots of land, livestock. And then in a series of events, Job started to lose everything. He, livestock was stolen, others were, were killed. All of his children died when the house collapsed on all of them. And the second chapter of Job reveals to us what's happening in the backdrop. Job 2.7 says, Satan, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with loathsome sores 
from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which he, to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes with all of these sores and boils and things. Now Job lost everything except, except his wife, and she didn't help much. Uh, in the middle of all this pain, she said to him, Job 2.9, uh, do, you, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And Job responded in a wonderful way. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's suffering continued. Some think it might have been a few weeks. Other commentators think it might have lasted several months, this suffering. He grieved the loss of his children. He lost his wealth, lost his health. His health was rotting away, literally. And then his friends came. They tried to help initially, but uh, they, they, when they finally started talking to him, they just were blaming Job. They kept telling them that this was happening because Job had somehow sinned against God. And, and Job kept telling them that this was not the case. He told them that their perspective on his pain, sometimes that is the case, but this was not it. He told them that, that their perspective on his pain was not an accurate assessment of the situation. And then in Job chapter 13 and in Job chapter 19, I'll read them back to back because he says some incredible uh, perspective on suffering. And he said, uh, Job 13, 15, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job understood that even though the devil was in this, uh, it was the devil who struck him. Even though this world is broken and that it's filled with death and disease and disasters, Job knows that, that God is the one who has the final say. And even if this season of suffering leads to death, Job's faith will not be moved, though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. And then in Job 19, he says, But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Now hold on. He's still in pain. Kids are still gone. His wife's still there. He's still suffering. And in the midst of it, he said, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. So Job didn't understand why this was happening but Job knew who. He didn't understand why, but he knew who. He knows that his Redeemer lives. God is not dormant. He's not passive. He's not so far away in heaven that he's helpless to do anything about our plight. No, Job knows that he's the one who calls the shots. He knows who to turn to. He knows that his life is in God's hands, and, and, and Job knows that he won't be done until God says he's done. And if today's that day, then so be it. And Job was a great man of faith. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't frustrated or disappointed. He didn't pretend that he didn't have problems. No, he, he was in it. And in the middle of all that uh, manure, let's call it. He looked up. He held strong. You know, it's one thing to say that we have faith in God when everything's going our way. But our faith shines brighter when the darkness descends on us. And in the midst of our emotions and in the midst of our 
fears and frustrations, in the middle of the uh, stress and the strain, we still hold on because we know that our Redeemer lives. And in the end, the devil does not win. We are on the winning side. I love how in Psalm 46, the writer is describing an unstable world. In the four, first four verses, he's talking about earthquakes and oceans and turmoil and crumbling mountains. But then in verse 4 of Psalm 46, the writer switches from this scene on earth to the tranquility of heaven. And he says, a river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. I came here to tell somebody today that God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble, and he's not going anywhere. He'll stand with us by our side every day and every hour. His peace can comfort our, our hearts to now, no matter what we face. His love can fill us. His grace can cover us. Not because we're avoiding the difficult day, but right in the middle of it. God's purposes are still being worked out. In our weakness, he, we can turn to him for strength. In our battles, he'll help us fight. Mm, don't run. Don't cower. Fight. 1 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For we walk, for though we walk in the flesh as mortal men, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. So fight to the end. There was a little girl who was walking through a cemetery every day on her way from school to her house. Someone asked her if she was afraid of walking through the cemetery. She said, no, uh, no. Why would I be afraid? I'm just trying to cross to get home. I'm just trying to cross to get home. And that's what the resurrection of Christ has done. For those who are faithful to Christ, he's turned death into a harmless pathway home. That's our hope. Death is a, death is a bend, not an end. Jesus did not do all that he did for us, for our story to end in defeat. No, our story in Christ Jesus ends in victory. A victory over the darkness, victory over the world, victory over de every demon and devil when we submit ourselves to God's will. The religious leaders accused Jesus of being the Son of God, and Jesus told them that it was true. And this is the truth that stands before us still today. Every person has to decide for themselves if Jesus really is the Messiah, or is he a blasphemer claiming to be God? I'll close with this uh, famous statement quote from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus 
as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else, something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God." Close quote. Jesus was beaten and crucified. He was killed and laid in the borrowed tomb. And then Jesus did what no one else has ever done in all of human history. He arose from the grave after three days Jesus ascended to heaven. And today, Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus proved that he is who he said he was, the Savior of the world. But the question is, is he your Savior? Have you trusted him from your heart? Is he your Lord? If we try to deal with our sin ourselves, we'll never make it. We all fall short. And this awful trial that Jesus endured was an injustice, but it paved the way for us to be saved. This can be a new day for you. Your soul can be cleansed. Your sins can be washed away. And if you've not placed your faith in Christ Jesus, I want to lead you in a prayer of salvation. And no matter where you're listening today, here live or around the world, this is your time. Pray from your heart this prayer of commitment to God. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He, he came to earth to die as a sacrifice for my sin. And as he was raised to life at the resurrection, I believe that my soul can be made new. I trust him as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness, for saving my soul, and for adopting me into your family. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen.